This tutorial is going to cover a multipolar neuron and the graded potentials and action potentials that occur on it. We're going to start this tutorial by drawing a multipolar neuron. Now that we have our neuron drawn, we're going to zoom on in to the cell body to draw our ligand gated channels so we can explain the process of graded potentials. So our next step is going to be to introduce a ligand. So the ligand is going to be acetylcholine. Now, remember that acetylcholine is going to bind to these ligand-gated channels and open them up, allowing for sodium to move into the cell, causing for a localized small level of depolarization. Now we're going to allow this to happen all over the soma of the neuron which will provide enough graded potentials that they can summate to reach threshold and fire at our axon hillock and start the process of an action potential propagation. So we're gonna put what we've covered so far to graph. So we're gonna move over to the corner here and draw a graph. And we're gonna label it. We're gonna label all the different millivolts for the ranges that we see. Now remember we're starting at minus 70, which is our resting membrane potential. And we're slowly going to tick up using our graded potentials that are then going to spike up to plus 30, slowly come back down to minus 90, and then balance back at resting membrane potential. Recall that minus 55 is our threshold limit. So how do we get from minus 70 to minus 55? So what's occurring is we are summating these graded potentials and we'll highlight it with a yellow marker. The next step that we have to look at is what happens at the axon hillock and the axon when those graded potentials summate to reach minus 55 millivolts. So we're gonna come back up to this picture and we're gonna examine this specific portion right here. So we're going to zoom right into this portion of the axon and see what's occurring here. Let's start with our second type of channel. So in the SOMA we said that they were ligand gated channels, so that was our first type. Here we're going to have voltage gated channels. Now remember there's two types of voltage gated channels. There were sodium and potassium gated channels we can now draw them and insert these channels into our axon. Now that everything is drawn, let's talk about what happens when the graded potentials summate to trigger that action potentials. So, graded potentials come in and they will trigger that firing of the action potential once it meets threshold. Now, if we go back to our chart over here in the corner, Remember that minus 55, that mark right here, is where we are going to see the first of our sodium-gated, voltage-gated channels opening. So let's go back to our picture and to explain what happens when we hit minus 55. So as those graded potential summate, we hit threshold, those voltage-gated sodium channels will open, allowing for the influx of sodium. Now, as that sodium is moving into that axon, it is increasing the charge within that cell quite quickly, all the way up to plus 30 millivolt, which is the top of our peak. Now, this is our next benchmark. At plus 30 millivolts, two things occur. The inactivation gate in those sodium channels will close, blocking more sodium from entering the cell. The second thing that happens at plus 30 is those potassium channels will now open, permitting potassium to leave the cell. This potassium leaving the cell is making that internal environment more negative as it approaches a minus 70 and ultimately a minus 90 millivolt. So let's go back to our chart and look at what's happening as these gates open. So we'll keep our, our colors consistent and we'll say that the Green, we're going to highlight green. This region right here is where those sodium channels are opening and we're getting a rapid depolarization to plus 30. Now we'll switch over to red at plus 30. Remember that inactivation gate closes, blocking more sodium from entering the axon, and then the opening of the here 
of those potassium channels. Now, those potassium channels, remember, we had specific anatomy about them. They were slow to open and slow to close. Now, because they were slow to close, we see this hyperpolarization phenomenon going on. So we go from a repolarizing state to a hyperpolarizing state, and then our third channels, our leak channels, are gonna allow us, and we'll do our leak channels in um, a blue, are gonna allow us to get into this resting membrane potential again. Now, since we're on this graph, I wanna zoom on in, because I wanna talk about a couple of periods here. The two periods include relative refractory and absolute refractory. So we'll start by bracketing absolute refractory. Now remember that absolute refractory means that absolutely no stimulus, no matter how large the amplitude, can arrive during this period to start another action potential. So this is kind of like a blockade. We're allowing for one signal to terminate before we start a second signal. The next period is relative refractory. And we're gonna highlight that in orange. Now relative refractory means that we are pretty much done and almost back at resting membrane potential, which allows us to allow for another action potential to propagate if the stimulus, if the amplitude of that stimulus is great enough to bring us back into threshold, we can get another signal. So if you look during relative refractory, if we're at minus 90, we need a much larger stimulus coming in than initially we had because we were at minus 70 to bring us from that hyperpolarized state back to threshold. So again, absolute refractory, no stimulus, no matter how big could come in to set another action potential with relative refractory, that time period will allow us to get another action potential if that stimulus, if the amplitude, if the magnitude of that stimulus is great enough to overcome that hyperpolarized state. Now we're going to zoom on out and go back to our axon right here. And we have to talk about a couple things here. We've outlined what happens on one segment of this axon. What we're gonna to have to do now is elongate this axon to represent a much longer portion and multiple segments. Now that we have a much longer representation of our axon, we're gonna be able to outline the steps of continuous propagation. Now to start with continuous propagation, we're gonna zoom on out and we're gonna redraw this axon at three different periods of time. So let's start with our first one here and let's start identifying some parts. Now this is going to be our axon. This, if we were to draw a nucleus here, this is going to be our soma. Now, this initial segment here is going to be our axon hillock. Now, this axon hillock is where the stimulus is going to be begin. Now, remember that we have graded potentials that are coming in that are going to stimulate this axon hillock. Now remember that everywhere but the axon hillock, that membrane is at a resting membrane potential, which was equal to that minus 70 millivolts. That means that the inside of this cell is going to be more negative than the outside. And we'll denote that by drawing these positive and negatives. Again, this is a more simplistic approach to explaining what happens during continuous propagation as opposed to the specific details that we covered in the little drawing above. Now we can go back to this graded potential. So that graded potential is gonna stimulate a action potential at that axon hillock, which means that it is going to depolarize, meaning that the inside of this cell is gonna be more positive than the outside. And we can say that it underwent an action potential. So now that we have that depolarizing event at the first segment, we're gonna see that those positive ions are going to flow and spread to the next segment, causing that to depolarize as well, at which point we will see a reversal of charge again, another depolarizing event for the second segment. So as that second segment is depolarizing, we see that the axon hillock is undergoing a repolarizing event, at which point it is returning back to a resting membrane potential. Now we're gonna move down to the third one and see exactly how the next segment is gonna be depolarized and spread. And I'm sure as you guessed, it is going to be this sequence of events 
the subsequent segment that is going to be depolarized, the previous segment will return back to membrane potential. This continuous propagation will continue down the entire length of the axon until the action potential reaches the synaptic end bulbs. So this concludes continuous propagation. The last part of this tutorial is going to go through saltatory propagation. Now with saltatory propagation, we're going to draw two axons at two different periods so we can discuss the anatomy and then go through the actual steps that occur during saltatory propagation. So let's start with the anatomy. So we're gonna start up on top here and we're going to zoom on in and we're gonna talk about the actual axon. Now remember in continuous propagation, the axon was naked. It had uh, an area of low resistance in the axon with no insulation, nothing that's providing high resistance on the outside, which is why if you recall that we talked about electrical signals dissipate, they lose strength over long distances, which is why those uh, axons that undergo continuous propagation typically tend to be short. Now, the myelin sheath that we see in saltatory propagation, that myelin sheath, that coating of fat, gives us this high resistance. It protects and insulates that signal, allowing these action potentials to travel long distances. So let's draw some myelin sheaths and then realize that there are gaps between these myelin sheaths. Those gaps are called nodes of Ranvier. Now those nodes act as booster boxes. They have the sodium and potassium voltage gated channel that is going to boost the signal, allowing it to spread quickly through that next insulated segment. Again, going to the next booster box, et cetera, et cetera, which we'll draw in the picture below us. So we're gonna start with the process of saltatory propagation. Now, we start at the axon hillock, this initial segment right here. Now, what's happening is these positive charges are going to zip and speed through the myelin sheath, the areas of high resistance, at which point the signal is gonna dissipate but it's not gonna to dissipate too much. It's gonna be still strong enough that once it gets to those nodes of Ranvier, those booster boxes, it's going to open up those sodium and potassium channels, which allows for the signal to be boosted. Now, as that signal is boosted, it will then continue to zip through that high resisted myelin sheath area again. The signal will dissipate a little, but again, just enough to open up those voltage gated channels in the nodes. The signal will boost again as it passes through the next segment of the myelin sheath. Now, this takes a considerably less amount of time to propagate action potentials. We are skipping, essentially skipping, these large areas of myelinated axons and allowing it to travel to the next subsequent nodes. Now, what this does is it propagates that signal three to four times faster than you would see in an unmyelinated axon that has to activate and then essentially deactivate each, act, each segment of the axon, one to the next, to the next, and to the next. So this concludes our tutorial. We're gonna pull it back into the entire frame so you can see everything we've talked about, uh, including the, what happens with graded potentials, followed by action potentials, and our two different types of action potentials. I hope you found this helpful.